All right, let's get started. All right, so um, welcome to building website that work everywhere. My name is Doris Chen. I'm a developer evangelist uh, from Microsoft. So um, most of the time, I always feel people would love to give me some feedback or ask them some questions. So I list most of the content on this slide. Um, I'm based in Mountain View, California, and uh, I have been with Microsoft for about five years. Uh, before that, I was a Java evangelist at a Sun Microsystem for about 10 years. And uh, uh, I actually uh, spent quite a bit of time on the uh, web and uh, enterprise development. And then I probably will post this presentation onto my blog, which is the first link. But if you cannot write it down or you know, cannot remember, that's totally fine because I don't remember myself. Uh, what you could do is do a search, Doris Chan, and then the space MSDN. Normally, the top two uh, links uh, is my blog address. Twitter address, or T Chan, there's a T there. And then email standard Microsoft uh, format, doris.chan and microsoft.com. Okay, so um, I've been talking about uh, web development for many, many years. Um, and then today I'm going to talk about, uh, you know, uh, basically more like, uh, you know, how I could help you guys to be better web developers. We'll talk about a little classical subject, how you could develop website cross browsers with one single code base without really doing the fix for that browser versus the other. Now, before I get started with, I'd love to get some information about you. Are you here all web developers? Okay, cool. You have some exposure to HTML5 JavaScript? Very nice. Okay, so as you can see, I have a pretty busy agenda. Um, and then we're gonna talk about a lot of things like uh, how we're gonna do cross-browser testing, right? How would you know your code will work in one browser versus the other. How we would know at ahead of time. And then we're gonna talk about uh, some of the uh, things for the CSS3, especially the prefix, right? Is browser detection a good way to do things? Or should we look into some other ways like feature detection? What is part of use? How we could actually do callbacks? And all those subjects, I mean, all those topics are really, you know, uh, uh, you, you need to have a very good understanding. Uh, and then it will really help you to make sure you could develop one single code base and then make it across browsers. So first thing first, <clears throat> so cross browser testing. So um, I'm not quite sure the sort of like a structure in your company. Uh, you may have a development team. You may have a testing team. Right, so let's use a Hawaii airline as an example. So you have a really cool website for the airline. And then you say, ah, this is what it looks like in the Firefox. Looks like that. And your testing team says, is this what you look, what you expect? Because I see in Safari it looks like this, and IE or, or, or Chrome or some other browser looks very different. So we do live in a big world with multiple browsers. And then um, we were hoping we should only develop once and it will run on different browsers consistently. Unfortunately, that's not a reality because we do see a lot of difference, especially on your mobile devices, right? So what are we gonna do with that? And then you see old browsers, not to mention legacy browsers, they have various kind of issues, even modern browsers. Say we have a new browser with Windows 10 called Edge. Right, so what we could do with that? So, let me actually say a couple more things about the Edge. How many of you actually use the Windows 10 and the tried Edge? Okay, good, love to hear your feedback, all right? Um, so, one of the principle for Edge is, if you look at all those browsers, right? People usually say Safari and Chrome seem like they share a lot of things in common, has similar features, and then Firefox and IE, also have similar things, right? But with Edge, what we try to do is, we know there is some IE specific code in the browser, we wanna remove that side. So we're gonna reduce the purple side. And then there will be something in common, which is more from the Chrome and Safari, we're gonna actually make it more compatible with Edge. 
So this is really the design principle for Edge, so that uh, Edge, when you actually try to migrate your websites into Edge, you will have a really easy time. So this is the design principle. But then obviously in reality, you know, uh, the reason I'm talking about this is I want to help you guys to be a better web developers. I want to actually help you to look into the best practice and tips so you don't have to worry about when there is a new browser coming out, you have to really fix your code, right? So this is really the main thing behind this talk. So a few things for the testing tools, and these are pretty new. Um, most of the tools I'm talking about are free, and then I also uh, list the links there. For example, SciScan is some of the tools I would recommend. Uh, I will do a quick demo for that. That's a tool you could get into a URL and check to see what other things will be working fine across a browser, what other things you need to watch out. And then browser screenshots is also very useful. It will actually, it's a free tool, but then when you enter a particular website link, it will actually tell you the behavior of different versions of the browsers. So you could actually take a look, you know, at your, your, your site will look at it differently with a different browser. And then also, uh, if you want to test IE for multiple versions, you could use a virtual machine. Um, it will, you could actually get a free download of your virtual machine, so you could, even though you're running different OS, you will be able to test IE on those machines as well. Now, all those tools are free for you to use. And then one of the paid two is called Browser Stack. How many of you heard about Browser Stack? It's a paid two, right? It's a paid online service. The good thing about that is you don't have to install your virtual machine to set up a right environment. It's providing an online service for you. And then, uh, but obviously it's a paid version. As a matter of fact, the browser screenshots, the one I'm talking about, is actually based on a lot of feature of browser stack, right? So that's why you could actually use the uh, screenshots to take a look at uh, different like, uh, behavior on, across different browsers. Okay, so I'm gonna actually show um, something really quick. Again, this is Edge. This is a default browser for Windows 10. I'm using Windows 10. And then this tool is available for any browsers, not just for the Edge or, or Windows 10. So for example, I'm looking into the size scale. And uh, I'm actually, <laughs> ConnectJS is my guinea pig. So I'm actually running this, and you could enter any URL, you know, click on that. And what you will see is they will see some suggestions. And then if you see a little tick, that means doing great. You have the HTML markup, right? So let's see how fast this one. This is good. Your legacy plugins, you, you did not use anything like a Superlight, a VB scripts, or ActiveX. That's good. Fresh and PDF are totally fine. And then the one may have a problem is the libraries and the framework you used in your site. For example, this particular one is using jQuery 1.1, and then the most current compatible version or update version for that should be 1.1.3. So it is actually recommend you should always move on to the most compatible latest version, right? So if it's a 1.x, move on to the latest 1.x. If it's really 2.x, jQuery 2.x, move to the latest because there will be always some bug fix, some features there, which you kind of miss. So that's one sort of recommendation for you to look into your website. The other one, you look at it like a browser detection, it's fine. Looks like there's no additional browser detection. And I will be talking about that, why browser detection is not a good thing. CSS prefix. This is something I think a lot of websites uh, may run into. So this tool will actually tell you, say, Go into your page, they will actually tell you exactly where that uh, CXS prefix problem there. And you could go through that and tells you a lot of times people always put a prefix in front of a CSS3 feature because that feature is not final yet. But then they forget, for example, this text size adjust. They forget to put a text size adjust, which should be the final way when you present a CSS3 feature. So if you forget to do that, if you go into a non uh, Firefox browser, you may run into some issue. So this is actually tells you a list of things you may want to go back and check, all right? So this is a pretty useful tool. And uh, the other two I will mention briefly is a screen snapshot. Oops, so there is something. Okay, it will run for a little bit, but you know where to find most of the tools? Go to um, the dev.modern.ie and if you click on this site, 
you will actually see a lot of tools available like virtual machines, uh, side scan, browser screen snapshots, and also the particular developer, like a website developer tool for F12. And we'll talk a little bit about F12 tools later. So if you look at that, you know, I don't really have time to wait for all the generation. But then the screen snapshots is really good. You could see the IE, uh, IE behavior, Chrome behavior, Firefox, Safari, and a lot of versions. So you could actually take a look what's really going on. All right. So get us some idea about testing tools. Cool. Let's go back. All right. So, um, so we have some testing tools. And we determined, say, I have some uh, CSS3 prefix issues in the site, right? What are we going to do with that? So next, I'm going to actually briefly talk about CSS3 prefix. How many of you already get some ideas about the CSS3 prefix? All right, some of you. Okay. So it is really, um, you know, any of the standard group, HTML5, CSS3, they always have to go through a sort of like a period of time, like a wait for people to propose a proposal and then vote on that, finalize that. It's an evolution kind of period of time. It depends on the, uh, how complex a feature is. Sometimes it takes a little longer, right? So during that period of time, a lot of browsers try to support that particular feature. But because it's not final yet, right? So browser has to determine some way to distinguish their own implementation wait until final. So the way they do is they always put a prefix in front of that CSS3 feature. For example, transform, transit, all those things are not final yet. Cool. So Microsoft will put a prefix MS, Mozilla will mouse, Opera O, and then Safari and Chrome is put WebKit. So you'll probably see a lot of WebKit. That's mainly for Safari and Chrome, right? But in real life, if you want to do cross-browser support for your website, make sure you do all the prefix because you need to support all browsers, right? So make sure uh, you do all prefix. But it is kind of tedious. That is true. Like, look at a one CSS feature. I have to put a one, two, three, four, four prefix the CSS3 feature in my CSS file, right? That doesn't sound very convenient, right? So what would be a better way of doing that? So um, before I sort of get into some of the tools to help you generate all the prefix for that feature, let me actually go over some of the uh, CSS um, uh, features that you need to put a prefix, right? For example, box sizing. Frax layout, you probably will hear more about a Frax layout later. Uh, transition, transform, right? Filter, all those things. You need to put prefix there because those CSS3 features are not final yet. However, as a good practice, in your CSS file, you should always put the final version, like a box sizing. And then you could use two to generate all the prefix later on, right? So let me show you more later. So this is for the things you need a prefix. These are the things you don't need a prefixes anymore, right? For the radius, for the shadow, uh, front face, and so on. All those things, you don't need a prefix anymore. They are final. You could just grab it and use them. So there are two prefix kind of tools. You know, I feel it's pretty handy to use. Obviously, there are a lot of tools available. Um, there are different versions. Let's use auto prefixer as an example. You could actually do an online version, and then it's very nice. Once you put the, the CSS final feature, uh, like for example, transform, right? The tool would generate all the prefixes for you. And then they are using the prefix from canIuse.com. You use that as a reference. And then that's one way you could actually use online to just, you know, put in your CSS there and then generate a version with all the prefixed versions supported. Or you could actually build it into your uh, grunt. How many of you are using grunt? All right. So you could actually put it into your build script. That's actually a very common practice. People insert it there and make it a little easy to use. And then there's a similar tool called a prefix free, right? And you, they would do the, that similar stuff. So let me actually uh, just quickly um, show you what I mean uh, for the um, auto prefix. Okay, so you could have an online version, and again, the whole code base, everything is in the GitHub. So you could even take a look at the source code, right? And also embedded in your grunt if you're using that. <clears throat> so what you see here is a very simple um, CSS feature with things like a transition, right? User select, 
And then um, this is like the way, the version you should write, right? And then the two will help you to generate all the prefix, like a WebKit, MS, right? Uh, transition, you know, see all the, all the prefixes added there, right? So that's very good. Now, one thing I want to actually get your attention is, what if you do like this? You do things like WebKit, right? So if you do things like this, look at it. It doesn't know how to interpret that. So if you see WebKit transition, you wouldn't be able to generate any other prefix. It would just stay there because it doesn't know how to interpret that and add in prefix. So you have to be careful. Do not put a WebKit or any prefix in this um, side of the, um, of the uh, panel. Just put a final transition there. Then you could see I have a transition, I have the WebKit transition. So that's one thing you need to sort of pay attention. Always put a non-prefix CSS feature there and then use the tool to generate all the prefix. Sounds good? All right. All right, so very good. We've solved the prefix issue. Everybody's kind of happy because we have tools. We don't have to uh, write all the tedious prefix. Next, I want to talk about a browser detection and user agent. Now, um, if you look at it, this is just uh, sort of like a, some of the survey data for the browser. And uh, if you look into that, uh, there is a lot of browsers, and uh, you may never heard about that. How many of you still remember Netscape? <laughs> a couple of you. And there is uh, uh, IE6, and there is Safari uh, Windows 5.3. It's called a Maxon edition, and I never heard of that, you know. So um, all those versions are there, regardless of where I'm aware of that or not. Meaning, this shows all over the world the browser usage. People still using it, right? Even though this is a little old data. I'm not asking you to trust the hard number, but this gives you some idea. So would it be a big word? Everybody is using their browser for various reasons, some financial institutions, some legacy browsers, for various reasons, they have to stay with that uh, uh, browser. For example, um, Microsoft has been announced several times, IE6 is dead. However, if for some reason your client is still using XP, then you probably have to use IE6, right? So all those various reasons. So we live in a world with so many different browsers. So what are you going to do for, for, for your project, for your company? Are you going to hire a full-time person to test all browsers and figure out a problem and then fix them? It, it does require a full-time job, but uh, I probably wouldn't want to take this kind of job even though it might be high pay, you know, because it's so tedious. And you never know how many browsers are there in the world or how many browsers are there people are using, right? So, what I'm going to do, because if I'm doing this testing, basically it's browser-based testing, right? So think about it. it, it's probably not a good way to do things like that, right? So the other things people used is in the past is called user agent. How many of you are actually familiar with user agent? User agent has been pretty kind of popular in the past because all those uh, browser sets, we're, we're supporting each other. We put all the string in the, in the header, in the user agent, so we're gonna have most of the feature kind of like a supported in common, right? People are doing that. It's been sort of recommended to do that in the past for a cross browser development. However, this is not a technique, uh, a, not a good technique anymore. We should use feature detection, and we'll talk about that in more detail. So if you look at this diagram, right, this would show you how each of the major browsers, they pick all the user agent, the string, where did they pick up from, and how they're going to support each other. So um, one thing to mention is that you may haven't got a chance to see Edge as a user uh, agent. Edge is actually make it fully compatible, it's the same as Chrome. And then uh, the distinguish here is for Edge user agent, there is Edge slash 2.0. So, this, so if you look at all the other user stream, it's fully compatible with Chrome. So in other words, um, the, all the sites which is running properly on Chrome should be running properly on Edge as well. So, and, but if you look at some other um, browsers, they all have different um, way to support a user agent. But really, it is really not a good way of doing that. Um, so let's actually look at us one of the problem called user agent sniffing. Um, it is really, you know, um, kind of messy uh, when you want to use such a logic to test your code. 
So this is just a one quick example. It says if IE, if IE version equal to seven, <laughs> then we have so many different IEs, right? I mean, from five, six, all the way to 11, right? You're gonna test all single one of them. And then based on the different version of the browser, you're gonna do something about that. That's really hard to maintain. And it's not just IE. There's a Chrome, there's Firefox, there's Safari, there's a, for example, Chrome version for mobile, you know, all those kind of different versions, what are you gonna do with it, right? So really, it is really hard to maintain if you use such a browser-based version check logic. It is really, really hard, right? So we look into something called a feature detection. How many of you have heard about a feature detection? This is actually a very important kind of uh, concept or strategy I'd love to sort of share with you in this talk. Feature detection is really not uh, based on the browser support. It's more like, uh, uh, it's not uh, based on the browser version. It depends on if that browser will support that feature or not. So it's very clear. It's kind of yes or no kind of issue, right? If the browser is going to support HTML5 video, then I do this. If not, I do something else, right? So the concept-wise, the logic-wise, is so much simple. Then check into different version of the browsers. Sounds right? All right, cool. So if we look into this piece of code, right, I do a little test. So this one says, um, I'm actually, if I'm not using MSIE, I'm not using IE, then I'm going to use add event listener. If I'm using IE, then I'm going to use attach event. Um, so you know IE does use attach event for quite a bit of versions. So is this a good way of doing feature detection? Some people say no, some people say it. I'm not quite sure. <laughs> this is bad. Why? Because since IE8 and above, we're using add event listener. So IE8 to IE11, those are IE browsers, right? So if you use this logic, it will get into attach event, but they're not using attach event. They're not supporting attach event, right? So um, only older browsers of IE, they use attach event. So this way of doing things is still using browser-based version. It's doing browser detection. So it is bad. So what would be a good way to do that? This will be much better logic to follow. So what it says is, I don't care what browsers you're using, but if you are supporting add event listener, then I do this. If you support attach event, then I do something else. Right, so this would be a much better way to distinguish if your browser support that particular feature called add event listener, or if your browser support attach event. So this would be a much better way. This isn't that a browser detection. This is a more get into the feature detection. See the difference? Okay, very good. All right, so this is a much better. All right, so, um, so everybody agrees, feature detection will be a better way of doing things. Now, if we, <laughs> this is a piece of code uh, I did use in the past to do the feature detection. It's working, but it does look pretty complex. Well, don't feel bad if you could not read all the code. I did it on purpose, you know, you're not supposed to read all the code. Um, even the monkey will freak out because it's, it's really too complex to support a particular way. So next, I want to introduce you a really better, uh, in my opinion, probably the best tool to do feature detection. It's called Modernizer. How many of you heard about Modernizer? Very good. So Modernizer has been there for a couple of years. Um, it started with uh, like a excellent Google engineer, Paul Irish, you know, um, and then uh, it's 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 been you know evolving quite a bit since um, three or four years ago. Um, and I really liked it because um, it probably, you know, like I said, provide the best feature detection support. Um, and also, it's basically what it detects is very simple. Any of the new feature for HTML, CSS3, right? And then what's important is they update their list constantly. This is very important because you know new features of HTML5 coming out all the time, right? So you need to have a tool which will update it all the time. 
Um, and also, um, it really, you know, now it's getting much better. You could actually uh, come out with your own testing scripts uh, so that you could do more uh, sophisticated kind of work on top of that. And uh, the difference between now and a couple of years ago is now it even provides part of views for you to use. So part of you is a way for you to say, ah, if that a modern feature is not supported for that browser, what I'm going to do? You're probably going to use a part of you. And I will talk about that in more detail later. So um, I don't know if you could see it clearly. Maybe it's out of focus a little bit. But what is cool about that is a lot of people kind of worry about, hmm, I'm not going to add in a big library inside of my site. My site is really mission critical. I need to you know, really make sure it is very lean, very fast to get started with, right? So you know, the, with this modernize, it looks like I, I have to sort of you know, maybe sacrifice some of the performance. Oh, yes or no? Because a modernizer does provide a default kind of library for you to check all the features. But the beauty of that is it also provides a custom build for you. So you could actually pick the particular feature, the HTML or CSS3, you want to support in the build of your library, right? And then if you look at that, every time you, so for example, I click on WebGL, that feature, it just I adding that WebGL checking library into the modernizer library. And then it also provides a part of views, like for, for browsers, old browser doesn't support WebGL. What are you going to do? Right? So we'll talk about that in more detail later. So it's a, it's a very smart way to really insert the modernizer into your code. So now I have a way to do checking the feature, all those things. So would you rather to do things like this or you would like to do things just like this, but this is called modernizer way. So it's so much simple, isn't it? Right? So every time you want to check a particular feature, you just have to say modernizer dot the feature name. And then you could check if it, the browser support it, what you're going to do. If the browser doesn't support it, what are you going to do? Sounds cool? Okay. All right, so let's actually start with a very quick modernizer demo. I have a little, um, you know, to really prove the concept kind of demo. And you will see in the uh, uh, JavaScript level, I actually put the library modernizer into it. And then all I'm checking here, I'm checking two things. I'm checking the canvas. I'm checking the HTML5 audio. I'm checking if the browser support canvas uh, and HTML5 audio. If it support, I'm going to run some app. If it does not support, then I'll do something else. This is basically what I do here in the demo. All right, so let's give it a try. I'm using the uh, Visual Studio 2015 community version. It's a free tool. Everybody could download, and uh, there is a uh, really, it's free for you to keep, right? How many of you actually tried uh, uh, Visual Studio? Yeah, it is really a uh, cool tool, for me at least. Uh, I'm doing a lot of web, web development, and it has a really nice editor, you know. Uh, you could see it, you know. Um, all right, so let's actually try this one. Let's actually uh, try to run it in. So this is a nice site with canvas, right? And uh, with uh, HTML5 audio, looks good, fine. All right, so let's actually run it in Chrome. This is Edge, right? We could have run it in Chrome, so I just have to go to my options and the true see it actually has all the major browser attached to that Firefox Chrome um, Edge as well of course and IE right to so doing a Chrome similar behavior Chrome supports all those at cameras and uh, audio so one more thing to try is I want to actually show you some older browser so I'm actually using IE so first I'm gonna run in the default browser which is IE 11 right so it's totally fine it's actually, you know, really using all the uh, HTML5 feature. Now, I'm going to actually mimic the older version. So what I'm doing is click on F12 function key that works um, with Edge and IE. I'm going to actually choose a particular version, which is does not support a canvas. It's an old browser, does not support a canvas and audio. So now let's look at what's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> Fun hamster dancing. So if it supports all the nice feature, canvas dancing. If it does not support in this case, hamster dancing. 
So this is actually one of the, you know, just a sample for you to look into. So the idea here is, if it's working, this is what you're gonna show. If it's not working, you choose to use the part of use of fallback to support older browser, right? So let's actually put it back to IE 11. So I could do the demo next, all right? All right, so you get ideas about all those uh, part of use and all those things. So obviously, you know, we're not gonna use hamster dancing for your part of use, right? We need to figure out, you know, what would be a good thing for your part of use. So what are, what are part of use? If you think about it, what are part of use? Part of use is really nothing more than a JavaScript library using HTML, JavaScript, and CSS code, right? So what did they do? They're supporting the missing features. For example, that browser doesn't support Canvas, doesn't support HTML5 audio, then that's a way you can actually use the part of your code to fill in that missing feature, right? You could do a lot of mimic. And how do I find all the part of you? Let's actually look back to the modernizer. This is a modernizer, right? And then if I click on, uh, let's see, canvas text, or let's say maybe WebGL, let's see if I can find a WebGL. Uh, so if you actually say, let's say geolocation. So if you actually look into geolocation, and then if the browser is a modern browser, they support a geolocation, everything's fine, right? You could use the geolocation feature in HTML5. What if the browser is old, it doesn't support that? Then you could see there's a lot of part of use you could have shims, you could provide, it's provided, so you could use any of them. Now, my recommendation is always uh, test the different uh, uh, part of use for your own sake. Choose the one that will work the best for you. All right, so you could download and put in a code. And then the syntax wise is, is pretty easy to follow. So let's actually um, take a look. So part of use is really like a show you where to get a part of your libraries and it serves really nice way to, for you to sort of gracefully or dynamically to support all the version of the browsers, right? So without a really see something really different or, or really weird uh, response on one browser versus the other. So it is always, uh, I would say probably all the time, you should always check the feature is supported versus the feature is not supported. You should always implement those things in your uh, website so that it makes sure your website will run across modern browsers, upcoming new browsers, as well as older browsers. So th these are the strategies you should use. Now, part of use is not a, like I'm saying you have to get it from modernizer. You could always come out with your own part of use. You could always come out with own, your own like a library to support a particular missing feature. That's totally fine, right? So that um, it, it will be, you know, uh, uh, depends on how you want to maintain your code. For example, you have uh, some piece of code which runs perfectly in the old browser. And now uh, you have a request to move on to the new browser. You could still actually leverage those old code, right? And then putting things like checking if it's a, a old browser, if the feature doesn't support, I'm still reading that. If it's a new browser, I'm using something else. So this is a strategy you always use uh, in your development. Now really, you know, a lot of people ask me, you know, um, you know, uh, how they should implement all the modernizer strategy into their code, how, should, how much they should preserve your, their, their existing code. Uh, my recommendation is, it depends on the, your client side, your client request. If your client wanna support some new browser, yes, definitely, right? If this is a pretty commonly used browser, yes, definitely. If your client's a, client is pretty happy with all the legacy support, they don't need a new browser, then no, you don't have to do that. And it also depends on your team, uh, how you're gonna maintain your code in your team, right? Because this is, a, a, you know, I don't know, Silicon Valley culture, the job, people change jobs every three to five years or even less, you know? So you don't know if the team member left the team and then you have to sort of worry about the maintenance or all those kind of issues. So all those things you need to sort of keep in mind when doing that. But uh, all I'm talking about here, using part of use, use modernizers, at least to give you a good approach to approach a problem. So even though your team members are changing very frequently, you know the basic logic, the good approach, the best practice is preserved, it's there, right? So that's a good thing. 
So um, we could do a manual pod of use. For example, there is a local storage feature in HTML5, right? This is a way you just actually providing some, you know, if it's not supporting the local storage, then I'm doing uh, all those things from my routine, right? This is my manual way. I'm providing a customized pod of use. Or you could do another easy way. Is obviously, I'm using geolocation again. You could use a modernizer, right? So it's very simple in the knee syntax here. Uh, you do a modernizer load, and then you say if the geolocation is, uh, that's a condition, right? Modernizer.geolocation, if it's tested or not. If yes, I'm running geo.js. If not, then I'm, I'm getting one of the geolocation part of you to do the work, right? So this is actually a pretty straightforward way to do, to support uh, the modern browser versus the Lexi code. Okay, so I'm actually, it uh, depends on the time, I'm actually uh, trying to show you some of the ways uh, we do things in real life. Uh, first, I'd like to talk about the video tags. How many of you actually work with HTML5 videos and audios in the past? Okay, a couple of you. So um, some of you probably aware there is an HTML5 video and an audio supported for modern browsers, which make our life quite a bit easier. Because in the past, how do we do video and audio support. We need to use plugin Flash, oh, Silverlight, right? Those things to be, right? So plugins are not a very user-friendly support because think about your end users, right? They have to install that particular plugins. Like I talked to my grandparents, as they run this piece of video, you can see it. And then they say, oh, I don't know, there's a little message asking me to install something. And I don't understand, what is that? Right? So all those things, plugin is really not a good design for any website. We should try to use HTML5 video and audio as much as possible. So very easy, if you look at that, uh, all the uh, HTML5 video audio is designed using the markup language. So you can see, um, I actually list both of the syntax briefly, and uh, very simple, you just list where the source is for that piece of media. And then um, you could actually decide if you want to preload something. If you want that, that piece of media to be auto-played, a lot of times we don't want to be auto-played because um, it could be annoying, right, all the time when you have a background uh, audio or some video. If you want to play it in a loop, um, and then if you want to have those controllers, meaning the button, right, play, forward, pause, and all those buttons. And then in the video, obviously, it's a little more complex because it does ask you what's the width and height, right, for that particular video, right? Audio doesn't matter. It's just playing some sound in the background. Poster is a good way to do um, uh, what they would call uh, help with loading because you may have a, a big video. And then when people click on that, you should show them something so they know the video is loading. There will be some video there rather than a blank screen, right? So poster is really a good way for you to put in some uh, uh, image there so that people know, oh, it's loading. I could wait a little bit. Part of the perceived performance, right? All right, so um, it is uh, majorly supported for all the um, modern browsers. And, um, of course, Edge is one of them. And then um, I actually always get questions. People ask about the compatibility. Uh, so I decided to have a quick table to help you. Um, for the HTML5 audio, um, most likely MP3 is your good friend because all the browsers are supporting it. And what is not so nice is web and probably AAC. AAC is a little tricky, like Firefox, you need to install the player, and web, uh, it does not support the web. So your best friend for audio is MP3. For video, more people using video. So a similar story, um, the MPEG-4 is your friend. All the browsers support that, so that's, uh, it's great. OGG is not, or did you look at so many other browsers are not supporting it well? And the WebM is also uh, not really supporting that well, uh, unless you actually install uh, some kind of plugin for that. So MP4 is your friend. And this is very good, I'm really happy because a couple years ago when I'm talking about that, I have to say, make sure you put a two video resource there, WebM and MP4. <laughs> now it's like everybody support MP4, so lucky you, know, you don't have to worry about any other format. Sounds good? Right. Okay, so next I wanna actually share with you um, a particular technique called fallbacks. Thanks to all the support in HTML5 and uh, audio and video, 
they actually provide a way for you to do the fallback. What means fallback? That means if the browser, I'm using video as an example. If that modern browser support HTML5 video, then I could use all the video feature to run that piece of video. However, if that particular browser is an old browser, it does not support any of the HTML5 video, then I could actually put in the middle of that video tag, say, if I put what will it render, right? So it would depends what plugin you want to use. If it's an old browser, you have to go back, fall back gracefully into a plugin kind of uh, format. So in that case, in, sorry, between the video tag, you could insert your JavaScript, right? In this case, it's a fresh support, right? So HTML5 video providing a very easy way for you to fix your existing code to get ready for the modern browser which support HTML5 video, right? So um, this is basically say video, if it's support and I'm getting all the detail. If it does not support, simply put a JavaScript in the middle and then putting all the uh, fresh kind of uh, SWF things into it. Sounds good? All right, so very simple. Now I'm actually going to, um, let me see what time is it. Okay, I should still have some time. All right, so let's, let, let's talk one more thing about that. The medium query fallback. So a lot of people were using medium query. How many of you never heard of medium query? Medium query is actually the really the fundamental for the responsive web design. All it says is depends on the screen size, the dimension of your browser, of your browser on the, uh, on the uh, device, then I would do something differently. So um, in terms of that, everybody, almost all the browsers, they support the medium queries. But not all the browser version are supporting this new feature. This is a new HTML5 standard feature. So in, if that's the case, if you go back to the older browser, for example, IE7 or something, right? Then you probably want to use um, a, a kind of like a part of you kind of library called Respond. This is a very useful one. All you have to do is insert it into your JavaScript called respond.mint.js. And I have time, I will do a quick demo for you to understand the uh, medium query. But once you do that, then make sure all your uh, browser will support a medium query will support a responsive design. So when you resize your browser, you will see different things, right? Um, a very easy way to see is in a desktop, a big browser, you could have more detail. You have high resolution of the image. But in a mobile phone, small screen, right? You may not have so much detail with the border, with, a, with the, the image resolution, right? So you would actually change all those kind of look and feel. So that's a very good, uh, a uh, useful feature for responsive uh, web design. It's called medium queries. All right, so I want to spend a little time to talk about a real life application. It's really focused on the plugin pre experience. Um, let's actually look at uh, this site. So I actually have uh, already put it there. It's called the World Star Hip Hop Entertainment Site. What it does is providing a lot of video clip for a lot of uh, big stars, interesting events, or movie clips, right? So here, I'd like to take a look at uh, this particular movie trailer. And then uh, I'm a, a person who wants high security. So I turn off the, what they call plugin support. And then if you look at this site, what you see here is there's no video, right? And then they ask you, you know, there's a bunch of an autoplay, but there's no video there. This is on edge. If you look at the, the Chrome, it has similar behavior. There's no video. If you look at that, if I, I turn off the plugin support. So, which is not very good experience for you, isn't it? Because you're expecting to see some video right away. So how are we gonna actually fix the problem? So a lot of times I talk to developers or customers, they always say, mm, my site is not broken. Please don't <laughs> convince me to fix it, you know, because I'm using some plugins like a Fresh or whatever there, right? I don't want to fix it. So I said, well, there will be a better way of doing things. We could be using some tool to help you to fix your site without really uh, invade or, or change your code, real site, life side of code, and you will see the end result, right? So it's a very easy uh, way to do that. So the one I'm gonna use is called Fiddler. How many of you heard about Fiddler? Okay. By using Fiddler, let's first start a Fiddler. 
I'm actually is try to do is try to change the response I have. Right? Let's go back to the Fiddler. So Fiddler is one, it's also it's actually give you all the all the HTTP request, all the information there. And you may not see it uh, very clearly, but you just have to uh, sort of like uh, trust me on this one. Let me actually let me actually try one more time to reload because I, I I'm not quite sure if I get all the capture here. www. Okay, let me redo it again. So one of the challenges here, as you could see, is try to find the right request. Try it one more time. If it's working, sometimes I feel the website is a little slow, so that you don't really uh, getting the right response. All right. So you know what? I'm gonna actually quit Fedora and try one more time. It looks like the network is really slow. I'm not getting the response I want. Oh, it's not a capturing all the data in the world. See the cursor is running? Yeah, let's see. Let's see what we'll get it this time. Let's see. All right, so I'm going to actually, I'm looking for this HTTP um, with the right video response. Yeah, I wasn't quite sure if this is a, a good capture because it looks like the size. Ah, yeah, this is good. All right, so you find your HTTP request. Yes, it's true. It's a little, um, you need a little patience like we did now. So this is the, uh, the word hip hop one. And then I get an HTTP request capture. Uh, what I want to do is I want to actually drag it here. <clears throat> I want to actually change the response of that particular HTTP request. So I'm going to the response, and then I'm going to the syntax view. And let me actually do something really quick. I'm going to the uh, title and change the title just a little bit. I will put a test there in the title, and I will save it. <clears throat> and let me actually go back to my code and read right now to see if it's there, all right? So now what you see here, let me actually make it a little bigger so you can see. So you see this test here on the header bar? This is basically from my response because I changed the code, right? Even though this site is still live, right? It's still running, right? So let's actually make it a little smaller. <clears throat> okay, next I will go back to my code to do more work. So, <clears throat> excuse me. What I'm trying to do is I'm actually changing the response of that video output. So let me actually do a, a checking after you try this demo multiple times, you know where to find your code. So what, I, <clears throat> what I'm seeing here is there is a little uh, place which they will actually generate all the uh, videos. And uh, currently, they're using Fresh, which is a code here. You may not see it that well. Uh, let me actually uh, do some change and show you the final result. So what I would do is, um, okay, let me, is it better? Oops. Sometimes, you know, it's hard to do those um, screen large because I, then I wouldn't be able to see my code that well. Okay, so <clears throat> I put a video, I put a <clears throat> controls, I put a where I'm going to grab that piece of video, <clears throat> which is, I'm actually <clears throat> getting it from here. This is a nice MP4 video. All right, so I'm going to actually put it there. And 
And then obviously, I need to make sure I close that video, right? That's a video tag. Now, <clears throat> the other thing I want to do is remember the video tag that I'm talking about, it's very nice. But then what if my particular uh, browser is a uh, old browser, meaning it does not uh, support the HTML5 video, right? What I'm going to do, so I'm going to actually put in the fallback code in the middle, like this, so that if it's an old browser, I could go back and support it. So let's actually uh, go into my cheat sheet <laughs> to find out my piece of code so I don't have to type everything in front of you. So let me make it a little smaller. All right. So all I'm doing is I'm actually checking the particular player or browser is actually supported, right? So I'm going to put it back into my HTML. And then adding a close parenthesis. And let me format it a little bit better. All right. Um, so this is a code I'm putting. If document create the item in the video, can play the type. That means this particular one does not support the HTML5 video, what I'm going to do. And this is all the fresh player fallback. All right. So um, put it back. The important thing is save it. And then go back to my browser, which is here, and I try it. Look at, look at what we have here. It's a video, right? I fixed it using HTML5 video, and it's running, right? Isn't that cool? Now, one thing that's not that cool is this video size looks like it's quite a bit larger. It's getting like a, a, a not very positioned well. So I'm gonna go back to my code to fix a little bit, all right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just go to the control panel, that area, and put a style there. So I put a style equal to width and 100%, and let's see what happened. Ooh, look at it. The size is perfectly positioned and resized on the side. So this is exactly the behavior I want, right? And then if you look at that HTML5 video, and then if you try it in Chrome, same thing. It's fixed with it's a live site, right? And it's fixed with the HTML HTTP response. And I didn't touch the code. I'm just changing it in my Fedora, right? Now, one more thing I want to show you is, you probably ask, what about a fallback? Let's try IE, right? Let's try to run this in the modern version as well as the old ver older browser, right? So this is IE running perfectly fine with HTML5 video. And then if you actually try it in the, in the F12, then you will see some of the feature for the older browser, right? So if you look at um, IE7, this is basically using fresh. It will fall back to fresh. If you look at that, look at this is fresh, Adobe fresh. So this is a fallback. And if you have an older browser, I'm changing to IE7, then this is what we'll expect. All right. So perfectly, this is, this example will just show you by changing a couple of lines of code, you actually will be able to um, fix a live website without a really, you know. Um, change the code. For example, if I'm going back to Fedora, I'm closing it. And then let's go back to the website again. This website is going to go back to the original. You're not actually touching or break anything. All right. So very well, I'm running out of time. And uh, uh, just almost like a few takeaways is 
avoid fraud detection, avoid use UA sniffing using feature detection. Modernizer is your good friend, and then try to use the polyfuse and fallbacks to support all the legacy browsers, and then get ready for all the modern browsers and the future browsers. And thank you very much.